What is up, church family? It has been a minute since the last time we came to you live, but we are here and ready to bring you a lesson that will no doubt change your life, or I hope it will, at least. Um, hope everyone is doing well, and um, we're here a little bit later than usual, but that's okay. I'm going to share this to the inside scoop real quick, and we're going to go ahead and just get started. Um, I am trying to keep these around like 30 minutes, so uh, we'll do Share inside scoop. Come on, post. All right. Uh, so we'll pray real quickly. Uh, let's continue to keep uh, Alyssa and her family in our prayers. Uh, well, both Alyssa's, quite frankly. Um, Alyssa with an E. Her husband's brother passed away. So we. continue to keep her uh, keep her in our prayers that there would be a quick recovery and uh, that the the um, effects of it wouldn't be uh, long lasting so um, uh, trying to think if we had I want to say we had another prayer request uh, we should pray for Brad uh, we ran into him at the gym and he's going through a tough time in his life right now so uh, let's pray uh, be in prayer for him, um, and I know I'm missing one, but uh, if you do have a prayer request, feel free to put it in the comments uh, or uh, private message me or post it to the church page or whatever. We'd love to uh, lift up and support, uh, lift you up and support you in whatever situation you might be in in prayer. So uh, let's pray. God, thank you for uh, another great day. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of serving you. Thank you for your wonderful blessings, God, your provision, Lord, and uh, all the great things that you are doing in our lives. I pray for uh, Alyssa's family, Alyssa's husband's family, God, as they suffer the loss of his brother, God, and I pray that you'd help them during this time of grief, Lord. I pray that you'd be a comfort to them, Lord, and uh, I pray that you'd just help them with any uncertainty, any financial burdens that might come or have come as a result, I pray, uh, you know, for uh, potentially any family, direct family he may have had, you know, children or a wife, and I just pray that you would be with them. Uh, pray for Alyssa's mom, God, that you would help her recover from uh, uh, the stroke that she has suffered. I pray, Lord, that you would give her a quick recovery. I pray, Lord, that it would happen in such a way that uh, she would she would feel your presence throughout this and and let it be just a, a great testimony for her. Um, and uh, just, you know, just I pray that you'd show yourself strong in this situation. I uh, pray for Brad, God, that you give him wisdom, God, that you'd uh, help him be encouraged during this difficult time in his life uh, and just uh, pray or maybe this is an opportunity to for him to draw close to you. And God, I pray uh, that you would help uh, all of those involved or close to him uh, to be your light uh, during this dark time. Um, and I pray for this Bible study, God, that you would speak to our hearts and minds. Lord, help us to break down the walls and uh, not have lines uh, in our life where we say that we're only going to go that far and no further. I pray, Lord, that we would be willing to follow you through anything to anywhere and that you would be uh, the one that we allow to dictate uh, where we start and where we go and and uh, that you would have complete control in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, so I want to talk to you about lines. And uh, the big question today is going to be do you have a line or do you have lines? And what I'm talking about is uh, 
the point where the Lord takes you and you're not willing to go any further. You draw a line. So, uh, you know, you'll forgive people, but you're not you're never going to forgive this individual or, uh, you know, it might have to do with something some way that you dress. I will never dress this way or I will never do this or or whatever. And we draw these lines in the sand. We're willing to go you know, this far with Jesus and no further. And that's really what I, I want to talk about today. Um, now, lines aren't uh, all bad. Um, some lines are definitely good. Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 20, it says, see that I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. And in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments that you may live and multiply and that the Lord your God will be blessed uh, will bless you in the land which you go to possess but if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them I announce to you this day that you shall surely perish you shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan and go into uh, to possess I call heaven and earth as a witness uh, today against you that uh, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him. For he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. There is a clear line in the sand here. One is to serve the Lord and one is to not serve the Lord. One is to choose life and, and good and the other is death and evil. And there is a clear distinction between these. And, and that distinction is a good, uh, you know, if you're on the side of good and life, that's a good line uh, that we should be separate from things that are evil and such. And so lines can be positive. Uh, one thing that um, irritates me a little bit is uh, anytime you uh, are conservative when it comes to living for the Lord, whether it's the way that you dress or what you choose as far as entertainment goes or uh, many, many other things, uh, people sit there and they begin to call you legalistic. Uh, they they look at your lines and they look at them as negative things. They say that you don't have freedom and uh, we get criticized quite often for a lot of these things. But quite frankly, uh, we probably don't have enough lines. I don't think that we should become legalistic, but uh, the benefit of having a line or a wall or a border is to keep you away from danger. You can see the person on the slide and the cliff. There is nothing stopping that person from going over the edge. And they're a safe distance back. But, um, you know, sometimes that line helps us determine what that safe distance is. And uh, quite frankly, uh, I would be thankful even if, I had to stand another 10, 10 feet behind where that person's actually standing. If that was the difference between me being safe and then me falling over the edge. And so lines can definitely be good. And I would say in the average life of, uh, in the life of, I'll just put it this way, most Christians today, this is my opinion, you can disagree with me, uh, but quite frankly, I think in the life of most Christians today, there are not enough lines. Um, and I'll give you some example of biblical lines that are clearly drawn. Job 31.1, it says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? Uh, you know, we can sit there and say, uh, you know, obviously, uh, pornography is wrong, right? But you, we may also look at women in bathing suits, right? Or, um, you know, you might watch a movie that has a provocative scene in it. And I'm speaking from the male perspective here. And uh, you might say, well, that's okay, because, you know, they're not in a bathing suit and they're not naked. But uh, it still takes your mind to places that it just shouldn't be. Uh, you see 
someone walking down the street while you're driving or whatever. And you really shouldn't rubberneck it and take the double look that you should make a covenant with your eyes. That's that's a line, right? That's a barrier. That's a wall. That's, that's something healthy to to put into your life. And uh, I think uh, and that's just one simple example. Second Timothy 2, 8 through 10, it says, I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Those are some lines. We shouldn't have wrath. We shouldn't doubt. And we should be willing to pray everywhere as men. In like manner, also, the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with uh, propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for a woman prof professing go uh, godliness with good works. Those are lines. Uh, men should be willing to lift up holy hands without wrath, without anger, without doubting, uh, without having to prove a point. It just should be something that we're not embarrassed of, we're not ashamed of, uh, but in the like manner also, Women should adorn themselves in modest apparel. Uh, they should, uh, you know, do things in moderation. Uh, and uh, what this should be a reflection of them pro uh, professing godliness. And uh, I know that these aren't, um, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and be the uh, modesty police or apparel police in your life. Or uh, uh, that, that's not my role. This is about a relationship with God, but to think that a relationship is void of any sort of boundaries, void of any sort of lines. Um, I, I made this, uh, I used this as an example when I was uh, talking to someone um, about some of these things and uh, in a relationship. So let's just talk about a marriage. Um, there are certain preferences that uh, one of the, you know, people in that relationship may have. So uh, the uh, the husband may have a pair of sweatpants that he's had for 15 years and they're super comfortable, but they have a bunch of holes and stains in them. And, uh, you know, the wife maybe goes out in public with them and it just drives his wife crazy, right? Um, now, is that that person sinning by wearing, you know, those... Uh, sweatpants that he's worn for the last 15 years or whatever uh is he sinning against his relationship with his wife well uh, you know maybe there's a relationship where the wife doesn't care but um in a relationship people do have certain preferences and uh i would say that uh that that man should put on a nice pair of pants and uh and re you know go out in a respectful manner with his wife. I know that's a silly example, but God does have preferences for us. God does have a uh, a certain way that he desires us to dress and act and uh, and behave and conduct ourselves. And, and there are many, many things in our life uh, that, uh, that, that God would prefer us to do a certain way. And when you're in a loving relationship and you care about the other individual, then your effort is to do things that, you know, the that other ind uh, pleases the other individual. And ultimately, our life should be something that pleases God. And so these are just a couple of examples of lines uh, that we should have in our life. And uh, and this is what I mean by you know there should be there should be things in our lives that reduce the potential of us doing something that jeopardizes our relationship with God or upsets uh, our relationship with God. And um, and far too much, I feel like, and, and, and more and more uh, as you know, time goes on, that people look at their relationship with God as I can do anything and God doesn't care. He just loves me. And that just really isn't the case and these are just a couple scriptures point that out uh philippians 2 12 it says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling uh you know we should be very careful with our lives in where we go what we do what we say what we consume whether it's reading or entertainment um who we are around i get that we're supposed to be reaching the world and saving the lost, but 
there is a line between being influenced by the world and being the one that is doing the influencing. And so uh, we need to make sure that we set things in our lives that protect our relationship with God, protect our relationship with our family, uh, protect our reputation. Uh, all of these things are very important. And so, and, uh, and we really shouldn't be uh, um, lackadaisical or, uh, you know, treat this um, with without the proper, um, uh, goodness, without the proper uh, energy or passion that we should. I mean, it, it's something that is very important. So we should put things in our lives to protect it. I don't know why I feel like I got to drive this point home, but maybe I'm just being super confusing, but um, big businesses. Uh, so if you take Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett doesn't own just one business. He owns many businesses. Why? Because if one segment of the business that he owns, so let's say he owns steel, Okay, let's say steel has a bad year and steel isn't um, as uh, profitable as it was before. He's able to hedge his earnings by having maybe something, a uh, business in technology that when steel is not doing as well, uh, the uh, in technology, uh, the technology sector that he owns the businesses does very well. And so he's able to maintain his uh, earnings regardless of uh, what may happen to the economy, um, you know, failing uh, a complete uh, bust. But basically, it's, it's not just sitting there and focusing his success on uh, whether or not this one thing does really well in our, his life. And if everything goes well with his business and steel, then he'll be super successful. Uh, he is uh, bringing in many, many businesses into his portfolio. That way, uh, even if one suffers a little bit, it doesn't jeopardize his overall earnings. Now, uh, in our relationship with God, uh, there might be many, many boundaries that we put in place for and and if any one of those boundaries potentially suffer, uh, it doesn't mean that we we lose everything, but we are protected within that hedge. We're protected within uh, those walls that we've created. And you put walls and you put uh, 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 safety measures around things that are really important. So think about a safe, a safe. Uh, the reason why we put valuables in a safe is because it has, you know, uh, what, four, eight, four, six, six uh, strong walls, right? Uh, not easily penetrated. Um, hard to break into those things that are valuable. And our relationship with God is valuable. Our relationship with our spouse is valuable. Our relationship with our family is valuable. Our reputation is valuable. So uh, quite frankly, they're there probably needs to be more lines in our life, not less. Um, now, in other ways, we have too many lines. Uh, Mark 19, 20 through 24, the young man said to him, all of these things I've kept from my youth up, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, what I mean by we have too many lines, uh, in our relationship with God sometimes, is uh, this uh, rich young ruler is a perfect example. He had talked about things that he had done from his youth up. He had respected his parents. He hadn't lied. Um, you know, he loved the Lord. He had done all of these things, right? And uh, he his question was, what do I still lack? And Jesus said, okay, great. It's awesome that you've done all those things, but uh, if you want to be perfect, go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. And that was too far for him. That was his line, that he was willing to be uh, someone who didn't lie and someone who respected his parents, but 
the line that he drew in the sand was, I'm not going to live without my wealth. If, if following Jesus means that I have to part with my wealth, I'm not willing to do that. And there are far too many things in our life where we draw those lines in the sand with Jesus. For instance, Jesus says that we should forgive that person. And we say, I'm not going to forgive that person. That person doesn't uh, deserve forgiveness. And we draw that line in the sand. The word of God convicts us about our lifestyle. And we enjoy that part of our lifestyle. And we sit there and tell God, I'm, I'm willing to go to church. I'm willing to read my Bible every once in a while. I'm willing to do good to people and feed the poor, but I'm not willing to get this sin out of my life. That's the line that you've drawn in the sand. And uh, in order to have the proper relationship with God, there can't be any lines. Luke 9, 23 through 24, he said to them all, if anyone desires me to come after me, let him deny himself Take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whosoever loses his life for my sake shall save it. Uh, Luke 14, 25 through 33. It says, now the great multitudes went with him. And he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciples. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my, my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether or not he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000 or else while the other is still a great far off he sends delegation and asks conditions of peace so likewise whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple Luke 9 57 through 62 now it happened as they journeying on the road that some said to him Lord I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Then uh, he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another, he said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who were at my house. But Jesus said to them, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And then Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters for he will either hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon and you can't serve God and yourself. Um, and many people talk about mammon being uh, representative of the flesh. Um, but this is, this is what I've seen. And quite frankly, it's when you come to these points of contention with God that you really are able to determine who you are following, whether you are following God or whether you are following your own heart, your own desire, your own, uh, you know, interpretation or whatever it is. And, um, I, I've seen people come to this point time and time again. Uh, there was a friend uh, who I invited to church. He had uh, he had been baptized. Um, he had uh, been baptized in Jesus' name. He was attending church with me regularly. He was he was worshiping. God was doing awesome things in his life. There was a message that got preached about forgiveness, and that was the line in the sand for him. He had a, a stepfather who. Uh, was very harsh to him growing up and, and his siblings. And uh, he he said, I'm not going to forgive him. That was the line. It wasn't before long that he really didn't want anything. Uh, he he wasn't living for God anymore. And, uh, and I think part of that was he knew that in order to be forgiven, he had to forgive. And he wasn't willing to do that. And so he drew that line in the sand. Uh, time and time again, when it comes to uh, things like salvation in the Bible, as the apostles preached it. People sit there and they draw their line. That wasn't what I taught. That's that's not what I believe. I don't think you have to do all these things. They draw their line. And before long, at least I've seen in my experience, that they end up being far, far 
away from God when it's all said and done because you can't serve two masters. You're either drawing towards Christ or you're drawing towards the world. And, and when you draw a line, you automatically hinder your growth in the Lord. I was teaching a Bible study uh, to a man and man, I cannot tell you how much I felt the power of God Literally, as I'm sitting there telling them about Jesus' name, baptism, he's sitting there hitting his chest, weeping, just the power of God, just dealing with his heart. And he's like, I see it and and, and all of these things. And then, uh, you know, we, we meet up a few weeks later and he's trying to convince me that all you need to do is accept the Lord in, into your heart. And, and I go, I go, I know that the Lord gave you revelation. Like I was there. I saw it but he drew his line in the sand. He, for whatever reason, that that was his line. He, he didn't want to go past that. And uh, time and time again, I've seen these lines drawn and eventually what it leads to is uh, people following themselves, following their heart. And that'll always lead to destruction. You can't serve God and your preferences, your your flesh you can't you can't serve both and so we have to tear the walls down we cannot tell we cannot be willing to tell god no we can't draw the lines in the sand i'm not saying that uh it's going to be easy where what god asks us to do and where god might ask us to go and uh it it probably won't be easy uh jesus told the people you know uh uh, this is how the New King James Bible says it. It says, uh, 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 narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. It, it's a difficult way. Read Psalms 23, though I walk through the shadow of the valley of death. Okay, that's not probably the greatest place in the world. You know, it kind of builds this grim picture of where, you know, the roads that you have to travel down sometimes serving the Lord. But Thank God that God goes with us and with God, we can do anything. We are more than overcomers and we can overcome these things in our life. And the reason why God is leading us to those things is because he has better things in store for us. He has healings. He has great ministries. He has a uh, great purpose for our life. But as long as we draw that line in the sand and we're not willing to go past that, we can completely hinder the work of God that he wants to do in our life. It's not, and, and God doesn't put these things in our path to, uh, you know, to somehow trip us up. Um, uh, no man is tempted by God, uh, but in order to make us better, there are some things that has to be worked out of us, some hard things. And, uh, and uh, as a result, um, even when it looks like the road that God is taking us down, it just seems absolutely ludicrous for us to go down it. Um, the Lord knows that it's for our benefit and we have to trust him. We have to trust him. And, you know, sometimes we take baby steps past that, that line <laughs> that we want to draw in the sand. Uh, but we, we have to be making progress. You're either uh, growing or you're dying. There, there really is no in between. Um, it, you know, it, it's either that we're drawing closer to Jesus or, you know, we're, we're going further away. And so uh, we, we just, we, in order to have a successful relationship with Christ, we can't have these lines in the sand. Um, now, you know, one of the things that we really battle against um and it is a spiritual warfare, is this idea that there are no clear lines. There are, There is no clear distinction um, between those who are going to go to heaven and those who are going to go to hell. And uh, as a result, um, we, have, uh, we have fostered in our culture uh, parasitical relationships. 
with God. And what I mean by that is we believe that the relationship is one-sided. We receive, we receive, we receive. God's just supposed to do everything good for us and because just simply because he loves us and and everything's supposed to work out just the way we want it to. And there's no way that we could go to hell because uh, God loves us. Now, uh, God doesn't send anybody to hell. God never intended us to go to hell. The Bible says that hell had to enlarge itself. Um, and that's because it was made just big enough for the fallen angels and that was it. But uh, because of the choices that we make, because we choose to follow our heart, which the Bible says is desperately wicked, um, those choices have consequence and we have free will and he's not gonna interfere with that free will. And uh, to believe that there are not clear distinctions between those who follow Christ and those that don't biblically is just uh, frankly wrong. Like there are clear lines. There, there uh, the, the men and women of God are a peculiar people. They're a royal priesthood. They are separate. They are holy unto him. And uh, and we need to make sure that we're on the right side of where God draws that line. Matthew 22, 11 through 14, it says, but when the king came to see the guests, he saw a man uh, there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. Now, if we would have read a few verses before this, this is where uh, invitations were sent out. And uh, all these people were like, I'm too busy and I can't come to the party because of this or that. And so the the master told the servants, he said, go to the highways and byways. Um, and so they went out and told people, hey, there's a wedding. Uh, there's a great feast. Why don't you come? And the incredible thing about this story is for a long time, I'm like, you know, for this poor guy who came, you know, it, the Bible says they went to the highways and byways, right? Like they went up to a guy in the street and was like, hey, why don't you come in and enjoy some food? And uh, how would you be prepared for that, right? You didn't start the day thinking that you're going to go to this um, this feast and, and how uh, unfair it is that, you know, the master would expect this person to be prepared when he didn't even get an invite originally. Uh, but then I began to start thinking all of the guests who showed up were uh, there as a result of the people going out to the highways and byways. And they understood the significance of what was going on. And we can make the assumption because of the story that they all took the necessary um, steps or measures in order to make sure that they were properly clothed for the event. And for the one that didn't, there were consequences. And I tell you, you know, the Bible talks about things like we put on Christ um, uh, and uh, through baptism. And if the same spirit dwells in you that resurrected uh, Christ, that same spirit will resurrect our mortal bodies. Um, when you read Acts and look at what the apostles taught and preached, and I mean, we, we have a first hand account of their message and and what they asked people to do and and they didn't mince words and and this is they just told us the highlights the things that were really important and and I tell you I just I think it's really important that the same salvation message that Paul and Peter and Philip and all of them preached uh in the same experience that they had of receiving the spirit and being baptized in Jesus name uh, is uh, we should share that experience. Um, and quite frankly, that is a very clear distinction uh, between uh, people who 
have spoken in tongues as the the Holy Ghost has given them the utterance and those that have been baptized in Jesus name and those that live a life uh, you know women living modestly and 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 men you know uh, praying everywhere without wrath or doubting um, these are clear distinctions between us and other groups and these are the same clear distinctions that we see that Christ makes as uh, he talks about those uh, that will go to heaven and that those that go to hell. Uh, one last scripture for you here, Matthew 25, 31, it says, so when the son of man comes in his glory and all of the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Again, another clear line, another clear distinction. Now, if we were to read the rest of that story, he talks about, you know, feeding the poor and be and visiting those that are, are sick. But, you know, I think in our mind, we want uh, the 12-step program of making heaven our home. And relationships are not 12-step programs, okay? Uh, you know, I would not be a good husband if I just did the same 12 things every single day for my wife. I woke up, I told her I loved her, I made her breakfast, um, you know, whatever, just fill in the blanks. And if I just did that every single day, even though the days change and, you know, if I just did that, it's not a good relationship. And our relationship with God doesn't come down to just any one thing. That's not a good relationship. Salvation, quite frankly, is not a, uh, a, a one one moment in time that we can point to or whatever. Salvation is a number of things that we've done throughout our life in order to maintain our relationship with God. And so, uh, but they clearly uh, set us apart from those who do not. Uh, there is a clear there is a clear distinction between those who are serving God and those that are serving mammon. And uh, uh, you know the the crazy thing about uh, Matthew twenty two that we you know just read about the wedding feast, they're all at the same feast. I mean, if you think about it, they're all in the same church, if you want to say it that way. Uh, and so it's possible to be in the presence of the master. It's possible to be in uh, a place of, of truth, if you want to, or that preaches truth, say it that way, and not uh, have taken the necessary measures in order uh, to be um, uh, properly clothed. And so uh, I don't know uh, what lines there may be in your life, the things where you told God, I'm not doing this. And I can't tell you how many people I've had come to church and the presence of God is just amazing. They recognize the presence of God. They recognize, uh, you know, just how uh, powerful it is. And then they start saying, oh, well, you know, do you all do this or that or, you know, whatever? Oh, I can, I can never do that. I could never. Again, they start drawing those lines. You know, the reason why I believe that the presence of God is so powerful in our services uh, it's because um, of clear distinctions. It's because of all of those things that many, many people want to say, well, you know, I just, I'm not going to do that. It's because we've surrendered our life in such a way uh, that we've taken away the lines and whatever God wants to do in our lives uh, that we're willing for him, wherever he wants to lead us, we're willing for him to to take us. And quite frankly, it's, it's that, uh, those things that separate us and um, and um, and pleases God and allows Him to move within our services uh, with without any hindrance. You know, uh, hinder not the Spirit. This applies in so many ways. I just my mind gets drawn to you know, gifts of the spirit. How many times does God want to use us to do something? And we draw that line. Nope, God, I'm never, I'm not going to say that, even though I feel that's what you want me to say, or, 
Um, I'm not going to go pray for that person because I'm, I'm embarrassed. We draw those lines. We just, we really got to get those lines out of our lives uh, when it comes to where God is leading us. And we might need to shore up some of the lines that should be in place when it comes to things of the world, entertainment, um, you know, and whatever else. But I did okay today. It's, uh, well, we're in 40 minutes, I think, with the prayer and getting started. I probably kept it right around 30. Uh, I hope this blessed you. Um, I hope it challenged you. I hope it causes you to think about some things in your life or maybe some of the ways that you look at Scripture and um, is a, a beneficial um, influence to to help you draw closer to him. Uh, we we love you. If there's anything we could do for you, please let us know. Uh, our service times are Sundays at 3 o'clock. We meet right on 12th Street, right here in St. Helens on uh, at the Christian Church. Uh, we meet in the uh, Fellowship Hall. We'd love to have you for a service if you've You've never been. Uh, if you're interested in a Bible study, we'd be happy to sit down with you and cover any questions that you have about the Bible. And uh, or if you just you know need some positive people in your life, we can uh, we can be there for you too. Uh, let's pray, Lord. Thank you for lines that uh, God that we've put in our lives that help uh, keep our relationship with you safe and and all the important things in our life safe. And God, I pray that you'd help us to do away with uh, these hard lines in the sand that we may have placed that hinder our relationship with you. And uh, God, I pray that we would just allow you to take us wherever you want us to go and to establish in our lives anything that you want us to establish. And really, we there isn't enough that we can do. We can't earn salvation, but we definitely can do things to... Make sure that we're as close to you as possible. And uh, Lord, what better place is there to be? They're so wonderful. Everything in this world is going to fade away. Uh, all of the entertainment and situations and drama and preferences and uh, all of that stuff is not going to matter at all uh, once we die. And we're all going to die. And uh, it'd be so sad for things that are uh, so insignificant to have such a significant impact on the rest of our eternity. God, we love you. We thank you. We pray that you be with us till we all meet again. Help us to be sensitive to your voice. God, help us through this pandemic, God, uh, not and to love our neighbors as uh, we love ourselves. And God, help us to keep you number one in everything that we do. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed in Jesus' name. Thank you for tuning in, being a part. Um, and uh, we hope to uh, see you and, and be with you or um, join you just for a time of uh, Bible study again soon. Lord bless.